Okay, so this is lecture nine of ECE 503. So um, what we've just seen in lectures seven and eight uh, gave us perspectives on discrete and continuous time tools for analyzing signals in the frequency domain. So what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to kind of like compare these signals from both an aperiodic and a discrete and uh, aperiodic to periodic and discrete time to continuous time perspectives. And um, your book has this diagram. So I'm going to just shamefully um, regurgitate it um, and add like some of my own artistic ability. So this is inspired by your textbook, but in reality, this appears in almost every textbook on digital signal processing. And what we have here is sort of a relational diagram. We're going to see several of these in this lecture. So this diagram here, what this guy shows is essentially, here's your continuous time column, right? So on, on the left. So you have time domain and frequency domain representations. On your right hand side, these two columns represent discrete time signals. And then the top row represents periodic signals, and the bottom row represents aperiodic signals. And what this does, in a very nice way, explains how, like, you know, if you have continuous time, periodic waveform, and continuous time, aperiodic waveform, discrete time periodic waveform, and discrete time aperiodic waveform, how do, how do their frequency representations look like? Are they discrete? Are they continuous? Are they aperiodic? Are they periodic? And it's kind of interesting. It's kind of an interesting mismatch. Um, also, at the same time, you have the synthesis and analysis equations, how you go from one to the other given these domains. So what this, it's kind of, it's a little bit overwhelming, this diagram, but at the same time, if you want like a cheat sheet, if you want like a single one-stop shop to explain everything that we talked about in lectures seven and eight, this is it, right? So what we've got, if we look at continuous time, periodic, um, what we have is, uh, in the time domain, we have the repeating, like, let's say, continuous time mountain, 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 mountain. And what we saw is, when we take the uh, continuous time Fourier series of this, we have the line spectra, right? Line spectra is not periodic in the frequency domain, and it's discrete. It's have, like, you know, here's your CK at 0 and F0 and 2F0 and 3F0 and both minus and positive frequencies all the way to minus infinity and plus infinity. Then, if we look at the discrete time periodic signals, totally different ball game. We have, you know, the periodic stem plots, you know, over and over and over again. And what we saw is that in the frequency domain, they're also discrete. But, okay, they're discrete, and at the same time, they're also periodic there as well. If we go to the lower bottom left, what we see is if we have a continuous time, a periodic waveform, what we have in the frequency domain is a continuous aperiodic frequency response. And then if, let's say, we discretize it, so we have an aperiodic discrete time waveform, what we get is we get spectra that's actually continuous. It's across a continuum, but it's periodic with every 2 pi, right? 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi. And then we have the relationships between all of them. So this, over the last several hours of me ranting and stuff, um, the last several hours, we've come to this sort of, sort of cache of very powerful tools. We're only going to be using a subset of them in this course, but it's good to know that they're all, they all exist in both continuous time and discrete time. So let's, let's, let's delve a little bit more deeper into uh, discrete time. So what we're going to talk about, oh yeah, I love talking about this because it's always a lot of fun, especially if, let's say, you talk to the layman who does not have any signals background and stuff, and you talk about odd and even signals. It's like, that signal's odd. Hey, you might hurt his feelings. No, but really, um, what we need to do is we, there are certain properties of signals that um, we can characterize, that happen true and true over and over again based on uh, the representation of, like, you know, if we have a time domain characteristic, uh, that it will be represented in the frequency domain. And so we, we can go back to that matrix, and we can see all these relationships. But let's suppose 
that the time domain signal has additional um, characteristics. So first of all, we're going to make the assumption. So first of all, here's my notation. When I talk about a Fourier transform, in this case, in the discrete time uh, Fourier transform, I'm going to have a cursive F, capital F, like that. And this, this arrow represents Fourier transform pair. This is exactly like lectures five and six when I talk about Z transform pairs, right? Um, if we have a time domain representation, and here's the equivalent frequency domain representation. And so, we can decompose every time domain signal as a, a combination of a real component and an imaginary component. So we have x of n is equal to x r of n plus j x i of n. And its frequency representation is equal to x omega is equal to x r of omega plus j i, uh, x i of omega. So if we do that, now we can start exploring some really cool, interesting stuff, including the stuff I was about to mention about odd and even and such. So what I'll do is, if we look at the synthesis and analysis expressions, and we insert into those expressions what x of n and x of omega are, what do we get? So for the analysis expression, so the, for, uh, let's say, just a real, so the x r of omega, it's going to be equal to this guy here. And x i of omega is going to be equal to that guy there. And vice versa, also for the time domain signal. You might say, well, there's a lot of math. What do you mean, professor? I'm kind of tired. It's late at night. OK, well, let's, let's actually do this. <laughs> it's not late enough. OK. Oh, see, I love this tablet thing. OK. OK. So x of n is equal to x r of n plus j x i of n, right? And we have x of omega is equal to x r of omega plus j x i of omega. So now let's take the um, let's take one of the expressions. So uh, what was the so let's say we take um, the the initial that, that Fourier transform. Okay, so so from minus infinity to infinity, x. Uh, no, I messed up. Ah. Let's try again. Oop. So we had those two. I'm not going to rewrite those. But so if we had this guy, this um, x of omega, what is the, this guy equal to? That's right. E to the minus j n. Correct? Now, what I'm going to do is the following. Uh, replace all these guys with their real and imaginary components. So now I have um, x r of omega plus j x i of omega is equal to the summation, and here's the brackets, of x r of n plus j x i of n e to the minus j n. And OK, that's cool. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this guy equal to, by Euler's relationship, 1 half cos omega n plus j sine omega n. So I'm going to expand it out. So if I put that in, oh boy, you know where the math is going to come from. So Now what we do is we uh, solve this. And so what we have is, well, let's take out that pesky half, because that's annoying me. <laughs> and now what we have is um, x r n cos omega n. And then we have plus x r n j sine omega n 
plus j x i n cos omega n minus x i n. And the minus is because j times j gives you minus 1. Uh, x i of n sine omega n. Now, um, what we want to do is we want to break this expression up into real and imaginary terms. And that way we can have this guy here and that guy there. So at the end of the day, we know that this guy is going to be real and this guy is going to be real. And this schmo and that schmo are imaginary. Okay? So therefore, x r of omega is equal to half sum n equals minus infinity to plus infinity, and then brackets x r n cos omega n minus x i n sine omega n. And then the other guy, ah, technology, avoid that stupid little thing. Okay, is equal. Uh, 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 uh. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. Um, <laughs> is equal to this guy. We get rid of the J's. Is equal to x r of n sine omega n plus x i of n cos omega n. And that's so. Th so what we've got is this is a relationship between. Um, the real and imaginary components of the time domain signal and real and imaginary components of the frequency domain signal. Yep? Oh, no, so it should be two. So the question is, why is it one half? And you're right, it's not supposed to be one half. Uh, Yul so Yilder's relationship um, for cos. Well, well, uh, so it's e to the j omega plus e to the minus j omega, right? Divided by two. Yeah. yeah. And then sine is almost that, right? Except it's minus. And what's the difference? Is it two? Two j, right? So what ends up happening? So if you combine this together and you have it in this relationship. Um, so there is a factor two. I think I messed up. Should be multiplied by two, not divide by two. But it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's only a constant. It's also to annoy this little bottom thing here. So, thank you. So that's how we actually got this guy here. So thank you. Those, are, those are. That's a great question. Um, so that's where we got these expressions over here. Now, um, let's take this one step further. If we have real and imaginary, so that's one type of representation, we can also decompose this into magnitude and phase, right? So what we can do is we can re-express all of this in terms of, like let's say we have this real and imaginary component here, and we take the square of each, the, uh, the real and the imaginary, when we take the sum them together and we take the square root, that gives us a magnitude representation, and the phase is take the imaginary divided by the real and take the arctangent of, no, sorry, the inverse tan of that. And that gives us the phase representation. It's exactly the same. So imagine I have a real and an imaginary axis. What I'm doing is instead of doing it in a Cartesian type of format, I now have it in some sort of um, um, uh, uh, polar coordinate type of format with radius and um, uh, phase angle. And so this is actually what gives rise to this thing called even and odd. And so the, the, the even and odd means whether it's symmetric around the um, y-axis or if it's anti-symmetric, right? And so in this case, if you have the magnitude of, of, uh, of um, your uh, uh, frequency representation, your x of omega, and you have the negative, that should be, we, when we have this relationship, it's even, but when they're kind of like opposite 
around the y-axis there, it means it's odd. So, okay, given that we have um, now the composition of these, these signals, so we can break it up into real and imaginary components in both the time domain and the frequency domain, let's take this one step further. And what we're going to do now is we're actually going to make a hypothesis. So like, first of all, or not hypothesis, we're going to break this down into several subcategories. Suppose that our time domain signal is real, okay? So what does that mean? x i of n is equal to 0. And I'm going to say that the signal is also even, right? So suppose that x n is real. And, and even, which means it has symmetry around the y-axis. What that means is if we plug this in, what will be our frequency real and imaginary components? It turns out that in the frequency domain, our real component has this sort of representation, right? Um, xr of omega. And the imaginary also happens to be 0. Okay, If it's real and odd, Right? Um, then what ends up happening is we get the opposite. We have the real component of the frequency representation being 0, and the imaginary is now non-zero and consists of a sum of signs. And then if we have purely imaginary signals, what we end up getting is this representation of the real and imaginary frequency representations, just a sum of sines and cosines. We no longer have that co complicated, messy sum of sines and cosines. Now we only have this guy here. And it can break up into one of two ways. If xi is, e is odd or if xi is even, uh, you can go either way in terms of the representations here. Either the imaginary will be 0 or the real will be 0, depending. So what I've just done is I've sort of created a family of possible outcomes if you have a specific x of n. If it's real or imaginary, if it's odd or even, it all decomposes into one of these possible categories that have exactly these shapes. So you know exactly what your frequency representation should look like. And so to make, you know, if you're a visual learner like I am, and this diagram is like everywhere, right? Everywhere. So what happens is you can relate time domain characteristics with frequency domain characteristics, whether it's odd or even, right, real and imaginary, based on this diagram here. So if you have a real time domain signal and it's even, well, now you know what the frequency domain representation is going to be too. It's going to be even and it's going to be real. Uh, on the other hand, if you have real and odd, what you're going to get in the frequency domain is you're going to get odd and imaginary, and vice versa. You have all this sort of like web, this relationship. But what you've got is this also this beautiful symmetry based on these relationships of odd and even, real and imaginary components. Right? All right. So last but not least, okay, is um, like what I mentioned in, uh, several classes ago, if you have a DSP textbook, and so if any of you visited me during my office hours, I think I have a few on my desk, not even from this course, just like, you know, they're all the same, uh, more or less. Some, some do better than others, but for the most part, uh, all of them will have this type of table. And just like what we saw in today's class test, where you needed to know the properties of the Z transform um, in or, like, you know, to do the shortcut. You can solve things by brute force and basic concepts, but you can also pattern match. If there's like an existing property, there's an existing table, there's an existing relationship, but you need to kludge it a bit. You need to modify it a bit. Go for it. And just say, according to property so-and-so, I can do this, right? This is exactly the same for the free, uh, Fourier transforms, right? So if you have a discrete time Fourier transform, you have several properties. You have linearity. That's a beautiful thing about Fourier transforms. They're linear, right? Uh, time shifting. If you have a time shift in the time domain, in the frequency domain, you have that pesky complex exponential. Um, time reversing. If you reverse in time, you also have a, t a frequency reversal. And the list goes on. Like my favorite, my absolute favorite, because I'm not a fan of convolution too much, convolution in time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain. That is worth 
every penny. Everything else that goes out, goes down and on and on and on, these are all kind of like really important. Like in fact, the one that I would say uh, for me as a wireless communications expert, or pretend to be, is modulation. Modulation is so important. With modulation, what I can do is just with a simple cosine, I can shift signals from DC, from baseband, to any frequency that I want. Well, OK, that's a very naive way of saying it. Like, there is like, you know, the RF engineers I need to talk with. But for the most part, modulation for me is really important. And then there are a variety of other properties. So you can either print this out and put it over your desk and look at it and memorize it. Or you find a textbook and you put a little sticky and you say, I'm going to remember these properties. You know, one of the two. So, so let's summarize lectures 7, 8, and 9. So uh, what we just covered. Um, so lecture 7 exposed us to frequency analysis using continuous time tools for continuous time signals and systems. Lecture 8 was the discrete cousin, if you will, and showed us some of the differences, especially when we're dealing with discrete samples rather than continuous time samples. Now, this lecture, lecture 9, kind of put in perspective that we can take these discrete time signals, right, and we can characterize them based on whether they're even or odd, real or imaginary, and we also saw sort of a list, a laundry list of properties that you can readily use in order to solve problems really quickly, okay? Okay, so with that, uh, that concludes um, lecture nine. Okay, so uh, don't forget that we have quiz three beginning of next uh, Wednesday's